Vlaamse second speaker, professor Mario Valerio, for his talk. Hello, morning. Morning, everyone. Um, Okay, so I thank the Mr. Chairman and the organizers for the opportunity to give my talk. And uh, this is a project uh, dealing with uh, calcium lithium aluminate, and we, I'm presenting here the experimental bits. And later on this afternoon, Rob Jackson is going to be presenting on the post session the modeling, the defect modeling that you have been doing. So in this experimental part, my student Giordano is the uh, postgrad student. Uh, we are doing in collaboration with some colleagues in the Brazilian Synchrotron National Laboratory. So the main motivation is that um, we can show in these three uh, nice pictures. The, the first one is uh, quite obvious. You have a material with each wing, so it's a natural host for rare earth doping. Uh, and you can show here a nice uh, photograph of the European emission, but you can also see up conversion in this material and also mechanoluminescence. So these are just a few examples of the motivation. And so um, we decide to uh, try to prepare these samples. And why we decide to prepare the samples is that the preparation mechanisms or the preparation routes that we found in the literature normally you end up with some additional phase, either each one illuminate or uh, each one oxide of some undesirable phase. So one of the targets was trying to get a pure or single phase calcium each one illuminate. So the, the aims are prepared the nanopowders and we choose a chemical route, the bikini route, and also to study the luminescence properties of undoped and rare earth doped samples. And a kind of secondary aim, but not less important, is actually to test the photoluminescence setup that we have now in our Brazilian Synchrotron National Laboratory, in the toro toroidal great monochromator beam line uh, that can cover this energy range nowadays. Um, and in the last four years, we've been helping them to, uh, to develop the experimental chamber for uh, photoluminescence. And this is a photograph of kind of present stage that we can, we can do now. So I'm going to skip this slide. It's just a structural part, but we can discuss that in the modeling session because we have a kind of, of uh, difficult thing to deal with is that you have a partial occupancy of the calcium and neutron site, but then we can discuss this later on. So uh, the methodology that we use to prepare the samples and to do the, the experimental parts is uh, summarizing in this uh, transparency here, you, this is a normal Pekini method. You end up with a resin, and then uh, to get the best calcination, we do a kind of pre-calcination, then we study the thermal analysis of, of, of the, the resin to get a clue for the, what would be the, the temperatures, and then we do all the experimental uh, characterizations. So uh, this is a kind of typical thermal analysis results that we got from these samples. And we have a few stages, but I'm going to focus on the last one, is the one that where we have the crystallization steps. So if you look to this curve here, you can get some few temperatures that you can test for the, the calcination stage. And that what is what we, uh, Giordano did, actually. And we, I plot here some of the samples that he got is a powder samples. Uh, he calcinated 100 degrees C, 900 degrees C, and 1,000 degrees C. And you can see that at 800 and 900 degrees C, we still have some additional phase and desirable phase. But if you calcine it at 1,000 degrees C for four hours, you have a quite nice single phase uh, powder. And if you put in some rare earths, and we choose the European, Terbium, Samarium, and cerium to, to test. Uh, there is no, no change in the X-ray diffraction pattern, so basically we are getting uh, a, good, a good sample. And we've tried different concentrations. Here I'm showing the 4% uh, is a nominal concentration. So if you look the, 
uh, the scanning electron microscopy, that's the undoped sample. We have also for the doped ones, uh, but are pretty similar. Uh, you have this kind of, non, uh, of powders, and if you do a lot of, of uh, scanning electron microscopy, you can uh, get the sizes of the particle. They are not round in shape, so we decide to measure the longest distance, the longest size of the particle, and the smallest size. And this is the way, the a kind of what is the distribution of the, the shortest and the longest uh, size. You can see that we are in a, in a, um, a kind of sub-micrometer regime, 100 uh, and 180 nanometer size particle. So for the luminescence measurement, uh, we've done in lab-based um, equipment in the visible and ultraviolet uh, region. Uh, we also could perform uh, photoluminescence lifetime. And in the UV and VUV, we, we use the TGM beam line. And also we do some radioluminescence using X-ray tubes, normal X-ray tubes, or the other beam line is the soft X-ray uh, absorption line and the standard XAFs being line in the synchrotron. And we also use it in the single bunch mode so you can have time resolution uh, for the radioluminescence also. Uh, to do the uh, measurements in the EUV and VUV region, you actually need to uh, do any steps because in this TGM uh, monochromator, we have a lot of harmonic contamination, so you have to put some filters, and you have to measure in different region. And the two regions that we use it is the region where we, we use a magnesium fluoride filter and a quartz filter. Then you measure some superposition area, and then you can reconstruct the whole spectra. So the typical resolution of the monochromator we have there is 500 E over delta E. And we can coll collect one emission spectra per excitation photo. So we have a full emission spectra for each energy that we stop. And uh, depending on, on, the, on the spectrometer that you use here, you can cover from 200 up to 900 or 200 up to uh, 1,200 nanometers. So this is a kind of uh, results we've got after these measurements. This is already... Um, uh, reconstructed. Uh, this is the 3D. You have the excitation energy here and the emission energy. This is a kind of surface plot and then this is a contour plot of the emission. And it's interesting because then you can draw some few lines and look to specific emissions and like excitation wave length. For instance, if, if you make a, a, a cut here, you get the, the, um, the emission spectra and we choose this energy, but we, we did that in a lot of energies here. And we can see the typical of a, uh, the uh, emission curve that you have. You have three main uh, emission peaks and some few other emission peaks that depends on the, the excitation energy that we are uh, impinging in the, in the material. And if we, we made this kind of analysis for a number, of excitation energy every 0.1 EV. We've got the curve, we decompose the curve so we can follow each one of the emission centers as a function of the excitation energy. And that is a kind of a picture that, the figure that we got, the three main emission peaks are this one, 2.57 EV, 2.94, and 3.23. And then we have a small intensity uh, but not less important emission centers. These are uh, undoped samples. Uh, and this small one here at 4.4 is uh, quite important because you can see it only appears here in this region. So analyzing all this data, we could, uh, we also take some uh, um, photoluminescence time uh, time resolution, and then this is an example of exciting it in a lab base with 4.7 electron volts and the emission in the main peak. You can have this kind of, of decay curve. We also did it exciting the calcium K edge. We're using the single bunch mode, and you've got this kind of decay curve. Uh, 
And this is the radioluminescence spectra of, of, the, uh, of, of the sample. You can also decompose it into main emissions. So we tabulate all this data and comparing to the values available in the literature for a number of other materials, we could interpret the, the, uh, the emission of the undoped samples in terms of F plus, F, exon, exciton, and we can also could uh, measure the band gap of the materials around 6.8 electron volt. So Coming quickly to the doped samples, we have the serum doped sample. This is a kind of, of result we've got. And if we magnify this region here, we've got this curve here. And this is one measured in the, in the laboratory. You can see that we can resolve all the uh, 4F, 5D transitions in serum. Uh, we can also look to the emission spectrum in a particular energy. Actually, you can do that in energy. We choose one of where the emission is, is higher. So we, you can also uh, separate in the two uh, typical emissions of the cerium. And if you look through all the excitation spectra, we've got this uh, excitation spectra here. And we can uh, pick the exciton and the band gap uh, energy of the material and here where we have the five, 5G transitions. Move to Europium, this is how the sample look like. It's an actual picture of the sample shining inside of the sample chamber. Uh, this is the, the 3D uh, emission curve that we have. This is the emission spectra that we could got. And this is the excitation. We have here the typical charge transfer band of the Europium ions. And we could also identify all the other emission centers, S, well S, D. Uh, F-type centers that comes from the, the pure matrix. And also we did that for the Samarium. And Samarium, we've got this kind of spectra. We look to the emission in two regions because we have to enlarge to get these ones. And then we've got these ones, and this is the typical excitation. And quickly, go into the turbium doped one. This is the turbium doped one actually inside the sample chamber. And the interesting thing here is you, we, we could resolve the two for a 5G transition, the high spin and the low spin configurations uh, by doing this kind of measurements. So to conclude, uh, we can say that we managed to get good samples. We managed to uh, interpret some of the undoped luminescence, actually figuring out the gap energy. And we could also interpret the luminescence of the doped samples. And it's important to say that the TGM beam line is a quite promising workstation for doing uh, studying properties in wide band gap materials. And I thank my uh, 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 funding agencies. And this is our group there. Giordano is here, the guy that do, did most of the work. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. It's time for questions and comments. I see the first one. And do you have direct confirmation about existence of the F plus centers in your compounds? For example, by EPR spectroscopy? <clears throat> no, we haven't done EPR spectroscopy yet. Um, we are proposing that these, these emissions are uh, due to the F plus center. The two main emissions that you have in the undoped materials are related to the F plus center. Because if you look to the, the, the typical lifetime is in the range of the F plus centers in a group of illuminators, for instance, if you compare, compare to YAG or uh, other illuminators is in the same range. So, but we haven't had yet a direct confirmation of the F plus centers. Okay, other questions? Alexander? Uh, microphone. Continuing these questions yeah. about exciton, so, F, and F plus emissions, do you have excitation spectra for different emissions showing that there are different bands yeah. of absorption? Yeah, yeah, we, we do have. Uh, actually, you can do that in the pure sample and the open ones. This is a kind of excitation spectra. 
you can take the excitation spectrum and what you see is that you have a lot of superposition because the centers are very close. We can actually get the excitation spectra by looking in different lines around, uh, you fix the emission and you get different lines here. But they are all very similar. And what we think is they are similar because you have a quite big superposition. And we are quite sure that these bands are there because if you do independent, if you get different slices here and you try to decompose the band, they are exactly in the same position with very few fluctuations, like 0 0.01, 02 electron volts. So we decide to actually look at the area under the, the bands instead of getting the real excitation spectrum. But you should use time windows for excitation spectra. Then you can separate these emissions because F plus and F has a very different decay time. And using time windows, you can yeah, measure yeah. this and separate these peaks because they should be separated, I think. Yeah, 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 you're right. And we are, we are be doing this experiment this next semester during the single bunch mode. So we're gonna be, uh, we're gonna have some extra results to, to tell the community later on, I hope. Okay, so I think we finished discussion at this point, so let's thank the speaker again. Thank you very much.